Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, we looked at uh, what is grief, what is bereavement. We looked at the normal stages of uh, uh, grief, what is expected from that. And uh, this next uh, uh, couple of minutes, we can, we, we're just going to look at what are some of the things that we can do. And uh, if, if there are, uh, you know, kind of specific principles or um, things that we can look into, that's also something that uh, we can, we can just focus. So before we get into what is it that we can do, just um, a couple of broad um, principles that we really need to keep in mind and what as counselors or, or those who are helping need to focus at. So one is to come, uh, the goal is definitely to help the bereaved to come to a place of awareness or an acceptance that the death has occurred. And this happens, like we said, through the, uh, through the process. So ultimately, we are hoping that the person who's mourning accepts this reality before um, as they are dealing also with the emotional impact of the loss and the best way to actualize this loss or to come to a place of awareness is to talk about the loss and the the role of a counselor here is to be a patient listener and encourage the person to talk about the loss maybe including certain memories of the past and of the present of the person they've lost. Even bringing the person to a sense of awareness that the death has occurred uh, can actually be achieved through some questions. So when you meet, when you're meeting with them to actually relive what happened. And if you see one of the one of the the things that people who who are bereaved only talk about in those initial few hours maybe lasting up to the funeral is talking about what happened okay um what happened through that period of death what uh, you know and that in itself a repetition of that as they say it in itself brings them from that place of not being in that uh, preferred reality into a place of an accepting acceptant reality so maybe questions of how did the funeral go or what happened um, how did this happen where were you when you heard the news so this is actually helping them to come to a place of building more awareness that the death has occurred the other thing that um, uh, another basic principle that we need to remember is to help the bereaved identify and experience those feelings. So there may be many feelings that they that they may be going through. Um, and it and often it it could be intentionally avoided by the bereaved because of the pain that they are going through. So the feelings like we spoke about is anger, it can be guilt, it can be anxiety, hopelessness, loneliness. These are all problematic for the bereaved in individual because at the time of, uh, because in times of the significant loss, the level of this intensity with these emotions are extremely strong. So these need to be uh, properly um, uh, dealt with and effectively targeted. Guilt sometimes yes need to be discussed and also evaluated and maybe even resolved in time remember these are not you know like one sitting kind of uh, sessions we're looking at our anxiety also needs to be identified in man so the role of the counselor is to assist them to explore these feelings in order to resolve and manage and overcome them. So identifying and experience these feelings enables them to feel a sense of release and encourages them to um, look at other options as well. Okay. Uh, what you're also doing, another goal that you're having is to help them live without their loved one. So this actually involves um, uh, in, involves them accommodating the loss by facilitating their ability to live without the the person who's passed away and also make those independent decisions so to assist this a counselor needs to use the prob a problem solving approach the counselor will need to help 
the bereaved identify the problems that has arisen since the loss has occurred. So this again is not immediate uh, at the time as soon as the death has happened, but then maybe a week or so in. Like for example, if it is a breadwinner who has passed away, right, um, working alongside with the bereaved about about uh, how you know how they're going to financially stabilize themselves. So here, these decision making techniques are very valuable here. Um, and uh, especially, like we said, when one, one person is the primary, uh, you know, the breadwinner, and when that person dies, the survivor has to experience, has to begin to make those decisions. So here is where the counselor helps to develop those coping skills and decision making skills to enable them to take over the role of that decision maker and minimize that distress. And often just to have someone actually talk about this and have a plan and uh, you know giving them hope that we can that there can be a plan that's that uh, can come up in itself is very helpful the counselor a counselor also needs to help them find the meaning in the death of a loved one for example you know some people who have experienced a loss may set up uh, you know maybe a, 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 an organization or a charity in honor of the of the one who is uh, diseased or they would want to uh, lobby uh, in for something uh, that has happened so this helps create a feeling that the death of the loved one was not in vain especially you know when those who've gone through significant struggles and and you've seen we've seen that uh, in in some ways where um uh, you, you've seen bereaved families who've lost people to suicide or maybe uh, young teens to uh, to bullying and, and thereafter suicide or to depression. That is, they, they kind of form a collective group or have a support system. So all of this um, are maybe finding meaning through the loss, you know, so the counselor helps to facilitate that. So meaning is also found in reassessing that those perceptions what do they think about the death and also about the loved one's impact on the on their own lives okay you're also uh, helping giving them time to grieve so we said grief is a process and it requires time and certain points in time maybe can be very difficult for for the survivor for example like we said birthdays or anniversaries or holidays they have the potential to evoke that experience of that loss and it is the role of the counselor to recognize these critical times and assist them uh, in uh, assist them earlier to to prepare to this um, yeah okay i hope that answered your question yeah so that 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 helps them to uh, sorry i'm just going to read that out for the benefit of the e learning students so samuel said i So the, the next thing that a counselor can do is also, um, uh, uh, you know, have I lost, am I, am I, am I audible? I think I lost everyone for a moment. I'm in between, in between. Uh, the voices, yes. but now okay. can... yeah, you can hear. Last, okay. I think for the last we heard was for the benefit of the e-learning students. And then, oh, and then... okay. All right. Okay. So I, I just, for the, Okay, I just wanted to make that uh, make the um, uh, comment that uh, Samuel had put up. He said, "I had always wondered why people started these organizations and charities in the name of the deceased." Uh, and he's written, "Now it makes sense. So it is to find meaning." Okay, uh, another thing that counselors can do is to um, examine. You know, as people go through grief, is to examine what can be people's defenses and coping styles. So your goal also is to find out how are they coping, and um, because this helps to identify what kind of functional coping strategies or good productive 
coping strategies they are using to dealing with the loss or if there is anything that is dysfunctional, anything that is um, uh, destructive. For example, um, one common ineffective way is to get into substance abuse, you know, to, to maybe uh, take on to alcohol or take on to drugs. And the counselor will have to look out for these ineffective coping mechanisms uh, because, you know, substance abuse, particularly alcohol uh, or any kind of substances that you take can actually intensify the experience of grief and depression and uh, thereby it it uh, it kind of impairs that uh, process of bereavement also so the counselor uh, what what as a counselor you can do is to help highlight these coping strategies that are employed and encourage the you know, the the survivors to evaluate the effectiveness and together that is you, you as a counselor as well as them explore newer better ways of coping that the that the client that the person can actually employ okay so looking in for coping strategies is very important and the last part which is also important to understand is to know when is it that the normal grieving process is moving into something that is pathological or moving into something that is not normal. So if you identify the existence of some kind of an extended pathology or extended disease factor that's triggered by the loss, it is suitable that, that you as a counselor make an appropriate referral. Now, what do I mean by this? Um, uh, so we say that grief is normal uh, when a person is grieving for the initial six to nine months post the incident of loss. Six to nine months is seen as a normal time of grieving. Anything beyond that, and especially when it comes with symptoms of dysfunction, that is, they're not able to get back to their normal sense of functioning, they're not able to um, uh, find any uh, hope to move on, there is significant feelings of helplessness, death wishes, suicidal ideations, uh, intense loneliness, complete withdrawal. Uh, the depression is becoming more clinical in nature is where you would uh, classify that as pathological. Okay, So they may, for people who don't go on, uh, who continue this kind of a uh, nature of grieving, may require a specific intervention uh, and and it may be beyond the scope of point is where referrals need to be made so that um, uh, uh, you know you're also you also understand whatever boundaries of training and expertise that you have and see that a little more so these are in broad what counselors do now what i'm taking you all into the next section is something anybody can do this is not specifically uh, what a counselor should be doing it's something that anyone in in a position of care uh, or a position of ministry can do one is yes they needing your presence okay um, as believers we are called to comfort and encourage and be at somebody's side so being there has has the greatest calming effect or the um, the thought of being one with their loss and their comfort so your presence is is an important factor so as so however much it is possible it is always recommended that you are um, there in in presence okay because um uh it's often like like I had earlier. The, the first thing that I said was, we may tend to withdraw because of the emotions that's rising up within us. But when we when we strike this at a balance, what they may be going through is far more significant than your inability, and your presence in itself. So just helping yourself see just your presence with absolute maybe just silence is more than sufficient to help them go through their loss okay what else do they need they need your sensitivity to be able to uh, help to accept whatever place 
or feelings or emotions that they are at, you know, wherever, if when we look at that, um, uh, th that process, they may be, they may be at a place of anger, they may be at a place of denial, they may be bargaining, all of that, but just being sensitive to that process and recognizing that it's okay that they are struggling in that area. So, you know, in your notes, it's, it's kind of given simple forms. It says, if someone is struggling, says something like, I can't do this anymore, avoid comments like, oh, yes, you can, or don't talk like that, you're going to be okay. Um, so what it says is what you're doing is to pushing away what is actually important in their place of healing. What you need to do is to help them to accept that those feelings are normal. And uh, you are there to support and listen and take those emotions very seriously. Your, all that you're called to do is to be there as a source of comfort and not feeling pressured to make it all right for them by minimizing the pain or the suffering that they are going through. The third one is practical assistance. Like I was, like we had thought about the case uh, earlier. It is just uh, knowing uh, of just being there practically to help. Maybe it's making a couple of meals for them. Maybe it's some form of childcare. It's uh, maybe hospital visits or finishing certain needed bank, uh, you know, legal documental work. So knowing what care uh, can be done can actually bring about a great sense of relief and help to, uh, to people who are in bereavement. Okay. How do you help? What are the other ways? Some practical ways to help is one, yes, to be able to go to visit those who are bereaved. They need to see and feel that they aren't alone. Uh, and this is not just during funeral and the days uh, summing to that, but even at a later point of time, to be able to keep in touch, to stay in contact. And if they were to shun you, like, um, not, not shun, but if they were to express that they needed space, uh, not taking it personally, but giving them uh, a place of understanding to help them know that you are there and maybe reaching out to them a couple of weeks uh, later to just find out how they are uh, how they are doing okay the next is yes to be swift to hear slow to speak slow to react to words and uh, things that may be said that is unchristian okay often saying nothing is the best thing to do okay saying nothing rather than saying the wrong things like I think Rupa was saying, you know, uh, they are an angel right now, or, uh, you know, um, God takes away only those he loves. I mean, those things are extremely insensitive things to say, or the work of the person has been finished right now. Um, you know, you should be happy that you had such a lovely person in your life. All of this are unhelpful. And uh, some, sometimes whatever we say can create a greater sense of bitterness or despair or anger. So uh, just keeping in mind that it's best not to just say anything, or even if you do, just being able to reflect what is happening. Like, for example, um, this, is, this can be so sudden and really shocking and uh, unbelievable. It just seems so unbelievable. So they, they begin to see that you have understood what they are, uh, they are going through, right? And, and so it, it also matters what kind of a stage they are in. Like uh, you would have noticed some people in um, those who are bereaved can actually just be in such a state of shock, they're so numb that they are not able to move and uh, to, uh, to, you know, to, to being in a place to getting them to do something may not be needed, but just support and, 
and uh, helping them through that phase of shock okay is what is uh, is is best needed okay just being a good listener being there not to solve the problem but just being there in silence is all that is also expected um not do not try to explain and everything uh, sometimes the opinions can bring a lot more of pain and sorrow and uh, um, you know it can bring about a lot of guilt so the the opinions that you may have can cause more anguish and especially when they may ask you difficult questions you know why did this happen did my uh, like I think Rupa was asking, right? The thing is, it because somebody sinned? Um, I think the best thing to at that point of to say is, it, yes, it's hard to understand all of this, and trying to grapple it all at this point of time can be extremely overwhelming. Best in anything at this point of time, but just to um, stand along with them. And maybe even say, you know, even I'm like Rupa said, I'm I'm not able to understand either. I can't grapple this entire thing myself. And uh, but then I'm here with you, here with you as we try and figure this out uh, over the time to come. So that's more important to giving him them that sense of understanding. Okay, um, often words is something that may not express as much but just a loving hug a handshake or a touch is something that is most uh, helpful okay uh, just just so that again you're showing your presence over there okay uh, uh, avoid uh, yeah i think the, hmm. um, avoid saying i know how you feel because often that isn't that isn't very true um, because you can only you can only hear about what they are going through but do, do not understand the depth of it okay uh, and in fact this is something that we are told in counseling never to make that statement of i know how you feel or you know i understand what it is that you're going through um, you're you're not able to understand you're you're only able to be able to reflect that this is probably what you may be going through and i'm not able to completely grasp the entire uh, gamut of emotions that one may be going through yeah okay? um the next one is not to rush them to get better or to play down that grief but to give it but helping them do it in the process that is comfortable for them in whatever you know how much ever times they may actually want to talk about the bereave you permit that giving them that uh, that place of uh, helping them take it at the pace that that they are in like like for example not to really rushing them being patient with the process of mourning and uh, uh, so, so it is. It's important to not bring in statements like, "Are you? Oh, aren't you over with this yet? You know, it's it's been such a long time. You should move on. You should get over it. You should be in a place of functionality." Okay, uh, it, that the 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 place of trauma can only heal um, in time. Okay, and. Uh, uh, to understand that for to to understand or to think that their expectations for them to move back into how they were is something uh, that we got to be careful about as we state it that they they may never feel that they are the same person like what they were because of the kind of loss that they have uh, gone through and lastly it is to continue to minister to win, uh, to win, visit as as and when needed and to ensure that uh, you keep confidence often um you know there may be many things that erupt in a mourner's life about the person who has passed especially if the relationship has been difficult 
and just for a place for them to really talk about their anger, their guilt, or whatever regrets they have. It is to find a safe space that they can do that and uh, giving them the confidence that one is there to help them through that process. Okay. All right. Um, I think I'm I'm open for questions. I'm I've completed that uh, you know this unit. Uh, any specific questions that you all would like to look into? Nobody? Yes. Yes, Kennedy. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Uh, what I wanted to just to get some guidance on, like in where we come from, during bereavement, there's a lot of feasting, a lot of celebration. Actually, people celebrate death. And uh, it becomes at times hard. Just the way Sister Rupa mentioned that we are insensitive. At times people become insensitive. So at times it's touching and it's because you, you are bereaved and one hand people are celebrating, people are feasting. So how do you advise on that? Thank you. Feasting, is it? People are feasting? Is that yeah. what you said? Ah, okay. Yeah, people feast. Yeah. Feast. That is that is on a funeral? Is that what it is? Actually, upon receiving the bad news. It's like people celebrate death. Yeah. People celebrate it. Okay. Okay. And yeah. Uh, yeah. can so, so can you tell me is that a cultural practice? Mm, yes, but now it's being it's it's being taken over. It's not particularly limited to one culture per se. It's being okay. practiced across the board, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because people will go mm -hmm. online, people will come make parties, like people just start partying. Okay, um, I, I actually, uh, uh, because I, I think we've noticed that in, in some cultures here. Does anyone have any insights on that? I'm not too sure if I, if I do understand what a cultural... Uh, so, Pastor? Uh, uh, yes, Shay. I, I used my grandmother as an example back in 1999 when she passed on uh, at the age of 70. So uh, we did the wake with the church service, she was buried. Then after that followed a reception, um, which was more like a celebration. A way, um, everybody was not mourning. Everybody was laughing, dancing, eating. Um, so, yeah, depending on the age in most African cultures, depending on the age the person passes on, um, there tends to be if the person left the earth maybe um, at a very old age, yes, there'll be celebrations, even though, yes, people would mourn. Um, but if it's a young person who died in their prime, um, very, very uh, rare, would you see any reception done or celebration? It's usually a very sad one, you know. So it's just depending on the age, um, for most African countries, I stand to be corrected, but that's the extent of my mm -hmm. knowledge. In my and and so, what do you what do you? Uh, I mean, I think we have a few of you uh, representing that culture. So, what do you see is the uh, idea behind that? And this is uh, not just among Christians, right? This is um, across cultures, right? Yes, across cultures. Yeah, Christians and non-Christians. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um. Okay. But apart from so, what apart do you from think the, is, is apart the from the, behind what, that? Sorry, what generally is the intention okay. behind that, okay. or, or the cultural practice behind that? Yeah, just like celebrating the life the person lived. So, oh, uh, oh it's and celebrating then the life the, of the person. The person, yeah, and then also just to entertain those who have left their homes. Particularly, some people live from far away. Just to come and um, um, commemorate the the barrier, you know. So you just want to entertain them, but majorly it's to celebrate the life that they have lived. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is something that's organized by the bereaved family. 
That's correct. Yes, the Buri family organizes it. Yes, it's difficult. I must say, during that, it's not something easily done, you know. But yeah, yeah. I, I, I witnessed both sides of my family. So at a young age, when they planned and all that. So um, yeah, it's not as easy as as we see. But but eventually, they just get over it, you know. And yeah, <laughs> that's mm. it. So is it an expectation that it needs to be done? Yes, yes. When the person uh, is older, so from the ages of maybe 70 and above, you know, there's an expectation mm -hmm. that, oh, we have to do a big reception, a, a reception, depending on the size. Most times it's always big, right? So, but if it's someone who left at their prime, uh, no, it's it, there's no reception. Even if there's going to be anything to give anyone, it, it just be take away, because it's a sad, it's a sad thing to have someone who, who would have lived longer, you know, pass on. Mm -hmm. So, but if the person is older, there's usually mm -hmm. like a reception to celebrate the life a of that celebration. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, anyone else has an insight? I think I have three hands here. Anyone has an insight on what uh, Kennedy and Shay brought up? You could bring that up. Uh, yeah, either Avni, Kennedy, Christopher, any of you? Yeah, I, I can just add over here. Uh, yeah. The community that I, I belong to, um, I won't call it a celebration. Uh, what they would typically do is um, they would, um, you know, organize some kind of food for, uh, you know, people who attend, um, you know, attend the, uh, the funeral. church service and uh, also people who are, you know, kind of who, are, who, who go to the cemetery. And um, that would be, you know, across, uh, you know, people who uh, who attend that, those those those, uh, those events. Uh, but in the in a in a more kind of a closed um, group of people who are actually, uh, you know, the immediate family members, um, and usually it's actually male dominated. Uh, there will be, uh, uh, you know, a session of, um, you know. Um, where people uh, meet at, at, a, at the house, or at the home of, uh, you know, the person who has, um, who has passed away. And um, typically there would also be, um, and at least in the community that I have, typically there would be alcohols out there. So it's just to sort of ease the tension, people will, uh, you know, kind of uh, just uh, get, mm -hmm. get a little more relaxed. And, uh, you know, there'd be sharing of uh, some, some of some of the, um, you know, what is actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, when uh, actually, there'll be some stories talked about, you know, the person who has passed away and everything. But it's it's not a, it's not actually a celebration. It's more of a gathering of uh, of close members of the family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Avni, you had uh, something to add, or oh, Kennedy. Avni, Avni, yes, you could go and then I, yes, yes, oh, Avni. Uh, I belong to Rajasthan, ma'am. So there is a culture there in Christians, basically, where uh, when someone passes away, so from the time we get the news, the there is, uh, you know, no cooking in the house. They don't burn the flame. That is a culture. So the entire community, the church community will carry food for them, for the relatives, everyone who's visiting for three days, like the mm. third day. And the third mm -hmm. afternoon, they arrange for a big feast kind of food. They prepare uh, non-veg gravy and, uh, you know, they have some tradition of some uh, kind of uh, bhajiyas and all. And I don't, <laughs> I've been out like 25 years, but when I go there, I find it uh, very interesting to see how, you know, they then they have this food where they culpinate and they say, now the cooking will start in the family. So what happens is, those who are grieving don't have to worry to feed the people who are visiting. Mm -hmm. So the food comes from the community. Everyone uh, serves that food, cooked food. They bring in tiffins, they feed and then they go away. So for almost like two days. So the third day, mm -hmm. it says like they will burn the flame. Now they will start after that uh, evening, they start cooking in the family. Uh, so until funeral and until the relatives leave, uh, the family is not supposed to cook basically. Mm -hmm. So this cooking is yeah. done outside the house. And mm -hmm. after that, they start cooking in the house. So this is how, and then they have a condolence meeting on the third evening. After that, 
when everyone leaves then the family starts cooking for themselves and uh, you know managing with the food so this is the culture in rajasthan in our uh, office <laughs> yeah there are so many adaptations of and hear you ma'am can't hear me now now the voice am i audible No, no, you're better. No. Yeah. So I said the, yeah, the the adaptations. You know how culture adapts and copes with with loss is um, is very different because here in South in South India, especially among one community, you will find um, as they're taking the corpse to the to the burial ground, you have a whole band in front of the hearse. and they are dancing and singing and half of them are under the influence of alcohol they'll be dancing singing throwing flowers and you know just making a mayhem and this is the middle of 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 a main road that you know and and it's it's a very slow process because you have a band right in front and and uh, all of this goes goes on with a family or the hearse behind so yes different kind of cultures um are uh, uh, are 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 amazing to see yes kennedy i think you uh, i i don't think i answered your question but uh, i i think it's 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 a good way to just understand this yes okay okay thank you maybe this just could be a side question as uh, i i know we have a cultural difference what i want to just to inquire as a side question i see in most burials or in most uh, this brief session people tend to dress in black or this there's a particular kind of color what's the myth or what's the idea behind it okay i think there again it's just probably i mean there is no the it's bla- the consideration that black is black 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 is a, generally consideration black is the color of mourning and i think that's why some cultures do it but then from from the time i remember in the kind of community i've been built up coming from uh, earlier it always used to be white but now uh, i do a lot of people dress black i think generally to show a sense of mourning yeah i think that's that's probably why i don't know if there's anything else that has uh and anyone else would like to contribute please feel free to uh, unmute and talk uh, shay you had a thought or you had something to say i had a question but yes i'm in line with the idea of the color it shows one is sad uh, mourning um bereaving uh, lost one so that's the color uh, yeah. my 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 question basically is just to get your view on what i observed um so there was a lady who lost a husband um due to an illness um so the husband was buried yes and then there was a service for thanksgiving just to thank god for the life of the person who had left uh, who had uh, passed on um now the lady because I, i was just reflecting on all you were teaching and i was asking myself if this was a right action so the lady was um, told to or rather the whole family including the lady the wife of this man who had passed on uh, was called out to you know just dance and um, basically a time of thanksgiving for the family members uh, and uh, we could see that she was still grieving right and um, and um even though she tried dancing you know trying to just show that she um in at least he's in heaven and all that uh, but we could see she was still grieving um but uh, the man of god compels her then you know to dance well uh, while the husband was alive he was one who used to dance during church service and compel her to dance you know uh, like he did um i understood both sides of what he was doing uh, i mean one side of what he was doing and another side my i was like i think we shouldn't have forced her 
Um, and through that, he was trying to encourage her, right, um, to let go of the sorrow and all that. But I think based on what you're, you've taught, uh, maybe my question is, at that moment, should we have, you know, uh, compelled her, you know, to show that she was, uh, even though she was mourning, but thankful that he lived a, a Christian life and uh, he's with the, Jesus Christ and we should just bust out in praise. And she should just bust out in praise without feeling sorrowful. Or should we just have allowed her express the way she wanted to, you know, um, praise God at that moment? I mean, that's just my kind of question I'm asking. Yeah, Shay, I, I agree it would, should be the latter, that you permit each one to express their grief in the way that they feel most comfortable in. So um, I, I actually, it is quite interesting to see when people in funeral services, uh, loved loved ones of those who bereave, the way that they respond. Um, uh, in fact, just recently I was seeing a video of one woman who um, you know just believed that there can be resurrection at that time and so then she it was a wife she gathered people there to pray alongside with her to raise the dead man the, to raise her dead husband and comes to a place of um, you know saying that uh, you know she's willing to let go and this is all in, in Forum being recorded. But then I think it's important for people to allow them to grieve the way that they see best. So there may be, depending on the kind of people that they are, like you, you said, you know, the, the minister here had asked her to, her to dance. She's probably someone who's a quiet personality, maybe would just like to shed tears in, in the, uh, within the four walls of her room. Uh, and you know to be to be to give people the space to do it in the way that uh, that seems most helpful for them, and I think that's important, and that we should be sensitive about that and not um, push them into something um, that is expected rightly to get. Thank you, Pastor, for that clarification. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, Samuel, did you have a question? You had quickly unmuted. Did you have a question or an observation? No, no, no. Okay. All right. Okay. Great. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, I think we'll uh, we'll close our uh, session here. Just uh, uh, just a reminder: I will be uploading the assessment today, the second grade, the second assessment. You have a week to complete it, um, and uh, please ensure that you complete it for your final. Um, this this goes into your final grading. So also for the e-learning students, that it, it also would be uploaded. For to ensure that you complete it before the 29th of uh, April so that it reflects in your certificate as well, right? Uh, let me close with a word of prayer and uh, may I request uh, any one of our students to kindly do so. Anybody could close with a word of prayer. Kennedy, would you like to close with a word of prayer, please? Yeah, yeah, no, it's okay, okay. Thank you, <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father. Thank you for this course. Thank you to everybody that has attended. And also thank you for giving us opportunity to come in your presence as we learn more about counseling. It's not by our own knowledge, Jehovah, but through your guidance, mercy that we are able to understand everything, Father Jehovah. I commit everybody as we uh, as we come to an end of this course that we're going to implement whatever we've learned. It's my prayer, my humble prayer, Jehovah, that we'll open and we'll open our minds, give us the spirit of knowledge and wisdom, Father, as we as we go to other various courses where we are and in our ministries, Father Jehovah. I commit everybody into thy hands in the mighty name of your son Jesus Christ. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Kennedy. So we will meet next next uh, week. That's our last class. So please do ensure that you're coming next week. Okay. God bless. We meet next week again. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. God bless you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, ma'am.